Have you ever been to an airport and thought to yourself, why are there so many Cessnas, Pipers and Cirrus? While today's airports may lack variety, it wasn't always like this, and many promising designs filled the skies. Sadly, most of these airplanes never stood a chance against fierce competition, and disappeared into thin air. Let's take a moment to celebrate some of the underdogs of the airplane world. The Darter Commander if you're working on your pilot's license, you're likely going to earn your wings in either Piper or a Cessna. Both companies have churned out thousands of their basic trainer models and are widely seen as the undisputed kings of flight schools. Over many years, many companies have tried and failed to dethrone their kingdom. Take Rockwell Aircraft for example. I'm sure that name rings a bell. Famous for their B-1 bomber and space shuttle, it's hard to imagine that the same Rockwell also tried to take a shot at Cessna. In the 1960s, long before the space shuttle, Rockwell created a product line they branded Commander Aircraft, with the goal of offering every category of airplane possible. Instead of designing airplanes from scratch, they bought out smaller manufacturers. They started by acquiring the Twin Commander line of aircraft, which already had a great reputation as a light luxury business plane, even being used by the President of the US. Soon after, they added the Myers 200, which they renamed the Commander 200. The 200 competed against the Beach Bonanza and Piper Comanche. They even had the crop duster market covered with the Ag Commander. Now the only void they needed to fill was a simple no frills training aircraft, perfect for flight schools and new pilots. And that's when they spotted the Volair. The Volair was a boxy high wing airplane sold in 3 and 4 seat versions and powered by a simple and reliable Lycoming engine. The Volair was originally designed as a bush plane in the same category as the Piper Cub and Taylor Craft. With that in mind, it was built like a tank with a rugged steel tube frame and a plywood floor. It would have been perfectly at home in Alaska with all the dirt runways. But before the plane even left the drawing board, its mission changed and it was redesigned as a small family cruiser and pilot trainer, even including a tricycle landing gear which became standard equipment in the 1950s. What really made it stand out was a distinctive tail that looked like it was copied from a Mooney. A handful of Volaires were built before Rockwell stepped in and took over production. Rockwell wanted a simple plane to build brand loyalty, so that owners could later step up into the Aero Commander Twins or even the Aero Commander 200. Rockwell then renamed it the Darter Commander. Rockwell filled up magazines with slick ads bragging the lowest price among four-seat aircraft, costing as much as $2,000 less for a similar Cessna or Piper. Well, you get what you pay for, and the Darter was no exception. Pilots soon discovered the bloated plane was slow and sluggish, with only 150 horsepower, the Darta could barely carry three passengers and fuel. While the Cherokee and Cessna 172 certainly didn't win any beauty contest, the Darta was considered downright atrocious, with its slanted tail, uneven windows, and blocky shape. Reacting to negative feedback, Rockwell quickly sprung into action and tried to iron out all the kinks in the Darta, and named their new plane the Lark Commander. Though the Lark was sold as an upgrade to the Darta, it turned out to be more of a band-aid solution. It now had a tall, swept tail and slightly rounder surfaces. To the untrained eye, the Lark kind of sort of looked like a Cessna, but most importantly, it now had 180 horsepower under the hood, which meant it could now fly just as fast as the Cessna 172. Never mind the Cessna 172 only had 160 horsepower. In only three years, Rockwell built 250 darters and Larks before shutting down the production line. Perhaps the biggest reason why the design failed was because Cessna and Piper had already saturated all the flight schools, and it wouldn't make sense to stock inventory for a new plane that no one heard of. By the mid 70s, Rockwell had decided that civilian airplanes were a bad business choice in the first place, and by that point had practically shut down all their product lines, which seems to have turned out okay for them. Would you agree? The Mooney Mustang In the aviation world, Mooney is pretty much a household name for fast and efficient airplanes, with their trademark backward tail. Sadly, Mooney is no longer around and went bankrupt a few years ago. But they had a great production run with their M20 series of light four-seaters. As much as we know them for their simple and fast planes, Mooney at one point was pretty ambitious and had a whole line of planes in the works to compete in every category, not unlike the Commander series I mentioned before. A twin version of the Mooney was in the works, and for a brief period of time, Mooney also partnered up with Mitsubishi and sold an ultra-fast turboprop, the MU2, which to this day many consider a hot rod. Aiming for the clouds, Mooney then hired an ambitious designer named Ralph Harmon. Harmon had worked for Beechcraft and was one of the main designers behind the Beechcraft Bonanza, so he was the right guy to take Mooney to the next level. 
and Harman decided the next level in small airplanes was pressurization. Pressurization was common on airliners and business jets, but never had been done on a light plane before. For a small plane to fly at high altitudes, pilots and passengers had to rely on oxygen bottles, typically used when flying anywhere above 12,000 feet. Using the Mooney M20 platform as a foundation, he came up with a completely new design. The new plane was very heavy to handle the extra stress that came with pressurization. In order to carry the extra weight, the standard 180 horsepower engine was replaced with a turbocharged Continental with 310 horsepower. The engine needed to not only carry the extra weight, but to generate extra power to pressurize the fuselage. The compressed air coming in from its turbine was extremely hot, so to keep passengers from melting, an intercooler had to be installed. Perhaps in an attempt to draw comparisons to the famous fighter plane from World War II, the new Mooney was named the N-22 Mustang. A lot of hype was built up around the new design, and so were the expectations. This was a plane built to cruise at 22,000 feet, high above afternoon thunderstorms, well at least some of them, and in much smoother air. This would provide both passengers and pilots a true luxury experience, typically found only on turboprops or business jets. One look at the Mustang, and you know this is not your typical Mooney. For previous Mooney owners, this is a completely different animal than what they are used to. For starters, the fuselage had to be overbuilt to accommodate the pressurization. As a result, both passenger and cockpit windows were tiny, especially for pilots who reported almost non-existent forward visibility while climbing. One very noticeable difference was how tall this Mooney stood above the ground instead of squatting low to the ground like other Moonies. The landing gear was built completely differently and the pilots reported ground handling was bad. But worst of all, the Mustang was completely stiff in handling in the air, which technically isn't a bad thing for a plane designed to fly at high altitudes, but the Mustang was tiresome to maneuver at any altitude, and pilots felt like they had to wrestle the plane. But all that aside, new Mustang owners seemed willing to settle with these small sacrifices. What sealed the Mustang's fate was pricing. Mooney was now building a very complex plane that was costly to build and totally out of their comfort zone. With the sticker price starting at $25,000, Mooney found they were taking huge losses with each Mustang built, and soon had to increase pricing to $50,000. After only 27 Mustangs were built, Mooney shut down the production line, leaving their owners stranded with a complicated plane to take care of on their own. The Mustang was a financial disaster for Mooney, and practically bankrupted the company. So, small pressurized planes didn't quite work out for Mooney, but Piper did eventually run with the concept and designed the beautiful Piper Malibu, which is still in production to this day. The Rushmire R90 Unless you're the nerdiest of Vav geeks, like me, you've likely never heard of the Rushmire R90, which is kind of sad, as the R90 was a pretty cool design. It was a great plane, born at the wrong time. In the 1980s, if you wanted a four-seater that could go fast, most of your options were born in the USA. While general aviation in the US was slowing down a bit because of the economy, in Europe, pilots had a different set of challenges ahead of them. Governments such as Germany were imposing strict noise controls around airports, which would soon become standard in other countries. While the noise controls aimed at improving quality of life for those on the ground, this made aircraft ownership a real hassle. I mean, airplanes are supposed to be loud, aren't they? Horst Rushmeyer rose up to the challenge and began work on what was to become the quietest airplane in his category. The R90 was designed as a high-performance four-seat airplane, and unlike any others that came before it, its main design goal was to fly quietly. For power, it was going to use a Porsche car engine adapted for aviation, which would have made the design 100% German engineer. Unfortunately, Porsche gave up on the engine, so Rushmeyer had to contend with an American-made engine from Lycoming. Long before composite Cirrus airplanes ruled the skies, the Germans pioneered fiberglass construction. The R90 was made from composite materials with a life limit of 18,000 hours, and was very light. For its passengers, the R90 offered a very spacious cabin, which obviously was very quiet as well. Pilots loved the R90, as it had control sticks instead of yolks, which made it a lot more fun to fly, or at the very least, made pilots look cool. The R90's high performance was the icing on the cake. It could cruise at around 165 knots with a range of 750 nautical miles. The defining feature on the R90 is a four-blade propeller. This was custom made for maximum performance and to minimize noise complaints from angry Germans. To help mitigate noise, 
engine power was dropped by 30 horsepower, and engine rotation lowered. See for yourself what the R90 sounds like when compared to a Beach Bonanza. Rushmeyer had big plans for his quiet plane, from a simple fixed gear version with lower power and lower price, all the way up to a deluxe version with a turboprop. Though the R90 was designed around German requirements, Rushmeyer knew the airplane had to sell well in the US to be profitable. Sadly, the R90 suffered the same fate as many new designs. It was priced too high, and there were simply too many used airplanes on the market driving prices down. Only 50 were built, and Rushmeyer filed for bankruptcy. There's still a handful of R90s flying in Europe, where they quietly generate a lot of excitement wherever they go. <laughs> the Aero Subaru Subaru is a household name in the automotive business, with an army of Subis around the world showcasing their products. So, if Subaru built an airplane, would you fly it? Introducing the Aero Subaru. This was the first, and last, four-seater airplane designed in Japan. Fuji Industries was a company formed shortly after World War II with the merger of several manufacturers, including Nakajima Aircraft, who built fighter planes like the KI-43 Hayabusa. Throughout the 1960s, Fuji Industries built and modified copies of American aircraft, such as the Beach Mentor. Their first stab at a new design was the Fuji KM-1 and KM-2. This was essentially a four-seat version of the Beach Mentor, with a canopy that looked very inspired by a 57 Chevy. Fuji engineers felt they had more to offer than warmed over American designs, so their very first effort was the Fuji FA200. It was named the Aero Subaru. The Aero Subaru was sold in a basic version with 160 horsepower Lycoming or an upgraded version with 180 horsepower and a constant speed propeller. Fuji aimed to build the Aero Subaru using techniques which made it much lighter than anything Cessna or Piper built and in turn making it a bit more costly to build. Once it entered production, it was found to actually weigh a little bit more than the competition. It flew about the same speed as a Piper Cherokee or a Cessna 172, but had a glazed canopy, like a military trainer. Perhaps Fuji thought this plane could appeal to both civilian and military flight schools. In fact, the Royal Australian Air Force was interested, but that deal didn't work out. The Aero Subaru could also perform light aerobatics when limited to two people. Fuji's plan was to offer a whole family of two and four seater planes, not only to be sold locally in the Japanese market, but exported as well. Only the four seater was built, even though Fuji aggressively pitched the design to many countries, it never sold in great numbers. Its main competitors were already selling in the thousands across the world, and could be bought much cheaper. Sounds familiar? It's not a bad looking plane actually. The bubble canopy gives it a lot of character. Besides, what other plane can you roll back the canopy and hang your arm out while you cruise around at 100 knots? Over the course of about 10 years, Fuji managed to sell around 250 planes. And what would you know, the plane has fans around the world, such as Germany, with a dedicated fan club website. I wonder if they call themselves Aero Subis. And just to be clear, the Aero Subaru has absolutely no relationship with the Subaru car brand. They both were owned by Fuji Industries, but they were completely unrelated divisions. However, if you're interested in owning an Aero Subaru, you will find support documents and service bulletins on the Subaru corporate website. The Bolanka Ares Last but not least, the Ares T250. This is a four-seater built by a well-loved company with a long history in aviation, Bolanka. Bolanka's history goes back to the 1930s when it was headed by Italian design pioneer Giuseppe Bolanka. Belenka always strived to build fast and efficient airplanes, and from the 1930s throughout the 1960s became synonymous with speed and style, especially with the Belenka Viking, its flagship wooden four-seater. By the late 60s, Belenka was going through a rough patch financially and was bought out by a company called Anderson Greenwood. Anderson Greenwood made their fortress building industrial valves for oil companies in Texas. So what was in it for them buying out an airplane company? It turns out that Anderson Greenwood had already tried their hand at aviation many years before. Right after World War II, they created a tiny two-seater named the AG-14. The cute little plane was promising, but once the Korean War had started, Anderson Greenwood turned to military outsourcing, which was much more lucrative, and eventually valve production after the war. Now that Anderson Greenwood was back in the plane business, they felt Belenka needed a bold new design to replace the old Viking and compete with the latest products from Beechcraft, Piper, and Cessna. And thus, the RZ250 was born. This is a complete departure from anything Belenka had built before. 
Unlike the Balenka Viking, which was all carved from wood, the Ares was 100% all metal. It had laminar flow wings and was powered by a 250 horsepower Lycoming, making it more economical than the Bonanza. In order to lower production costs, the fuselage was built using flat slabs of metal with very few curves. It had a distinctive single cooling inlet under the prop, which is what you'll see with most turboprops. This might have been done for design purposes and to offset the boxy fuselage. The main landing gears were very narrow, which made taxiing and landing a bit more challenging, but this allowed the wheels to fold entirely in the fuselage, making the wings thinner with less drag. The design was very clean all around, using flush rivets to keep the surfaces smooth. It could easily cruise at 180 knots while burning less than the Belenka Viking it hoped to replace. It could carry four passengers in a comfortable cabin surrounded by large windows that provided great visibility. All this was at the sacrifice of its looks. But then again, taste is pretty subjective. And even if you're not sold on the looks, performance and comfort might win you over. Sadly, by the time the Ares had finished development, the 80s was right in the middle of a bad recession, and general aviation was at the bottom of the barrel. Even Cessna was dropping their famous line of general aviation planes, so Palenka never stood a chance with the Ares. As it was, only five were built and only one is still airworthy today. There you have it. Hope you enjoyed this latest episode, and comment below what airplanes you would like to see featured on my channel. Thank you.